So the title of the sermon is Goaltending. When I was a kid growing up in Montreal, Canada, like all kids, I played hockey. Played hockey after school till it got dark, played hockey on Saturday, Sunday, in the summer, in the winter, you know, we'd play in the street. If you were lucky enough, uh, fortunate enough, maybe you belonged to a team, and then you got to play on ice. But you got to play on ice outdoors. So the entire season we played outdoor hockey in our leagues, junior, bantam, midget, you know, those were the different categories. And you played outside on the ice, and before you would start, you had to kind of shovel the snow off the ice. If it had snowed, you, you know, all these little kids would shovel, and they'd shovel the ice. And if it was 20 below zero, we played. We played outside, we played hockey, three periods, you know? and then there was a, a cabin, I think, and I, I remember a, a pot-bellied stove you know, with coal, it was, and you'd go in during the, the break just to warm up your toes. Everybody had their skates near the fire. Yeah, wonderful, uh, wonderful childhood memories of playing hockey. I also remember the greatest thrill of my hockey playing days was a tournament that we played at the Montreal Forum, the fabled Montreal Forum, the home of the Montreal Canadiens, the most winningest uh, hockey team, more Stanley Cups than any other team in history. And my position was that of goaltender. I played goalie and in those days goalies did not wear face masks, they did not wear helmets and they wore no throat protectors in the professional league. And it was the very same thing in the junior leagues and midgets and bantam. You know, you were a little kid, six, seven, 10, 14, 15, 18. Nobody wore helmets, not the players, not the goalie, no face masks, no other protection other than the chest protector and the pads, of course, the big gloves. Needless to say, you had to keep your eye on the puck at all times. So as a goalie playing for the Rosemount Eagles, I had three objectives to attend to in order to do a good job as the goaltender for my team. Number one, make sure no pucks got past me into the net for a goal. That was the number one priority. Number two priority was pass the puck whenever I could to my teammates that we could score. If I got the puck, I moved it forward. And then priority number three, avoid getting hit with the puck traveling at anywhere between 60 and 80 miles an hour towards my face. So each goalie, no matter which team you played for, had their style of play, you know, stand up goalie, sprawling goalie, all that type of thing. They had different team loyalty, different skill levels, but every single one of the goalies in the entire league shared these three basic goals. Number one, nothing gets by. Number two, get the action out of your zone. Number three, do not eat the puck. Well, I tell this little story to highlight a similarity in the Christian game of life. Each of us as Christians come from different backgrounds, we may emphasize different points of view as far as teaching is concerned. We may have been trained and grew up in different congregations, may even have different gifts as far as the Spirit is concerned. But each of us as believers have the same basic personal goals and tonight I'd like to describe three of the more important ones that all should attend to if we want to experience successful winning, if you wish, if I want to carry the similarity a little forward, if we want to have successful and winning Christian lives. Okay, goal number one. Goal number one is transformation. Goal number one is transformation. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, please. Want to read a passage from there? Paul says, Romans chapter 12, beginning verse two, he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 
So this is the appeal that Paul makes to the Christians he writes to in Rome. Now, that they have become Christians, or rather now that they have become Christians, they must be transformed from what they were to what God wants them to be. That's why I say goal number one, transformation. Now the word transform here in the original Greek language is from a word uh, that we're familiar with in a way, metamorphosis, metamorphosis, meaning a complete change, not just a superficial change, but a complete change. You know, a caterpillar to butterfly, that type of change, that's a metamorphosis, complete change. So Paul says that we must pursue this transformation. Of course, we have God's help, but we're not completely passive in this business of transformation, this primary goal as Christians of transformation. Pursuing this transformation, he says, requires several things on your part, on our part as Christians. For example, he says, don't be conformed to this world. Because in answer to the question, yes, Paul, you, you're saying that one of my primary goals as a Christian is to be transformed, but how do I do that? Uh, he says the first step in that transformation is not being conformed to this world. You have control over that. We must avoid the influence of the world to become like it in our habits and our attitudes. You know, I, I was loving Marty's sermon this morning because he was you know, laying the groundwork for my, for my lesson. And as we've said before, we never talk to each other, maybe a title, perhaps a sermon title, but we never discuss what each of us is, is preaching. And isn't that what he was talking about this morning? Not letting the world you know, mold you? That's the first step in the transformation process, not allowing the world to mold you. It requires us to consciously resist efforts to make us think and act like sinners and unbelievers. You know, when people see you, do they see Jesus or do they see the world? Is it a big shock to them when you announce to them that you're a Christian? Do they say to you, really? Oh, man, I would have never guessed that. Because if that's the reaction you get when you share the fact that you're a, you know, you're a Christian and you're a churchgoer, uh, you might not be doing a good job of making a witness for Christ if they're so surprised. If they say, oh yeah, well, I knew that you know, from the moment I met you for the very first time, I knew, I knew you were a religious person, I knew you were a person of faith. Secondly, how do you, how do, how do you, you know, get that transformation going? Secondly, renew your mind, he says. Change the way you think. What do you mean change the way? Change the way you think about things. An example, you're getting into a dispute with someone and the old you, how you resolve this dispute, that's the old you. The new you doesn't want to win the dispute. The new you wants to achieve peace between yourself and the person you're having the dispute with. Even if it means swallowing your own pride, even if it means you know, instead of puffing up, you, you go down in order to avoid violence, in order to avoid nasty words, in order to avoid uh, you know, um, getting into an argument with an individual. Renew your mind. Change the way you think about things, how you're going to handle things. Is your normal way of handling a, 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 you know, a setback getting discouraged and quitting? Is that the way you, you operate? Renew your mind. Change the way you think. Continually ask yourself, what would Jesus do? That's, we, you know, we've got those bracelets and everything and it's all, almost become kind of mainstream, you know, but that's a very serious thing. What would Jesus do? What does God want? How can I please my Lord? What does the Bible say about this situation or that situation or whatever? What you say and do is based on what you think. So that's the first place to begin this re-education, this transformation process. And then in the same verse, Paul also says that your part of this metamorphosis 
is to discover God's will. Let's read it again. He says, to prove what the will of God is. To prove, to understand, to know. The renewed mind ever seeks to know what is the good, acceptable, and complete will of God. To prove means to test or to find out. It's a question of focus. The transformed person is one whose life focus is to understand and carry out God's will. You know what happens when you begin to focus on God, really? What begins to happen is you begin to see things from His perspective. Even the simplest things become joyful things. I know, again, you see a butterfly, you, know? you just see a butterfly. The unregenerated mind just sees a butterfly. But the transformed mind sees something that is beautiful within God's creation, sees the intricacy of what God has done, the beauty of things. So the first goal of each Christian is to transform his or her life by rejecting the world and its sinfulness and begin to concentrate on knowing and doing God's will. And you know that you're pursuing the right goals as a Christian when it becomes very important to you what the, what the will of God is for every facet of your life. Not just, uh, you know, dear God, you know, what, what job should I take or should I move to New York or whatever. We're always wanting to know, we're always wanting to know His will in the area of what will be good for me. You know, will it be better for me if I move to New York and take that job or stay here and continue with this job? You know what I'm saying? I want to know God's will so that I you know, will know what will be the best thing for me. But the transformed mind begins to think, I want to know God's will to know what will be pleasing for Him. What can I do, Lord, in this situation that will be pleasing to you, regardless of how it affects me, that I might make less money or that I might choose a way that is more difficult and so on and so forth. That's secondary. God, I, I want to know what will be pleasing to you in the relationship that I have, in the habits that I take, in you know, whatever, whatever I consume. What is pleasing to you? That's, that's the transformed mind thinking. Okay, so goal number one, all Christians, transformation. I'm working on the transformation. Goal number two, fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. In John 15, eight, the Lord says, my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Imagine, it's so crystal clear here. He, he just lays it out. There's no way you could kind of you know, miss the point. He says, again, my Father is glorified by this, comma. <laughs> you can't miss it. Okay, Lord, how is your Father glorified? Then he says, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. In this passage, Jesus is talking uh, to His apostles. He chose them, He trained them, He taught them the whole word of God. But He tells them that once having received these things, they were responsible to do something with it. God is glorified by much fruitfulness. You know, the value of coming to church is not the fact that we get some sort of points for coming to church. Coming to church is not bearing fruitfulness. Bearing fruitfulness is actually doing something with what we've learned in church. Fruitfulness is carrying out the message that we've heard in church. Fruitfulness is responding to the needs that we see of the people that we are with in church. Okay. I mean, obviously, uh, attending services, uh, you know, that's an important part of the Christian life, but it's not an end to itself. You know what I'm saying? Attending services regularly, that's not a goal. That's a means. It's the means by which we grow in Christ. It's the means by which we begin to know God's will. It's the means by which we have opportunity to bear fruit. 
That's one of the reasons the elders stress the importance of attending services, public worship, because all those things happen while we do those things. And so Jesus says God is glorified, He's honored by much fruitfulness. Being chosen and trained and taught was not enough. The apostles had to prove to the world and the Lord that they were sincere and genuine disciples of Christ. Some think, you know, for example, that baptism by immersion or a cappella singing is the proof of one's genuine discipleship. Now those things are biblical and those things are important and how important they are, you know, if, if those of you who are in our doctrine class in, in the morning session, you know how important, for example, we talked about baptism, those, those things are very important. Uh, but uh, Jesus tells us that fruitfulness is also a sign of our faithful discipleship to Christ. Now fruitfulness is seen in many ways. For example, obedience to God's word, that's fruitfulness. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, John 8, 31. You know, this is where you know, the idea of baptism comes in and a cappella music comes in, that we only sing during worship or that we baptize by immersion, repentant believers, you know, we, we emphasize that idea. Well, what's important about emphasizing that idea and when individuals respond to the idea is that they're demonstrating their obedience to God's word. The word says you must be baptized. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. The word tells us we should sing we should sing, and so we sing. So when we do these things, what fruit are we bearing? We're bearing the fruit of obedience. But this isn't the only way to demonstrate fruitfulness. Soul winning, Mark 16, 15 and 16, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, you know, to go out into the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, preaching the gospel, right? We're to preach the whole world the gospel and win souls for Christ, that's fruitfulness. Service, Matthew 25, you know, the great judgment scene. At that great judgment scene, Jesus uh, describes and lists the good works that He expects from His disciples, feeding the hungry and, and, the, and, the, and the poor and visiting those who are in jail and you know, supporting those who are ill and so on and so forth. All of these things, are ways that we can bear fruit for God. And of course, you know, Matthew 25, that's not an exhaustive list, but we should check and see if we are actually producing fruit in at least these ways. Now some complain that they have no time. I got no time for those things. Or they don't feel like it, or oh, that's not my, helping people, oh, that's not my ministry. <laughs> really, <laughs> what's your ministry? <laughs> Yeah, my ministry is coming to church, and I've told you before, attending services, that's not a ministry. You know, when, when people attend services, they're being ministered to. They're being taught, they're being preached to, they're, they're being encouraged to sing, and they're sharing in fellowship, and so on and so forth. Okay. Most of the time, the problem is that we're too busy pursuing other goals instead of this particular goal. You know, career advancement, comfort, recreation, creating a quiet and out of reach position for ourselves. The problem, of course, with wealth, right? It tends to isolate us from the needs of other people. Certainly, some are ill and some are extremely committed, but there's always time and opportunity to produce some fruit if you really want to. And that's you know, one of those important goals, you know, the important goal, the must thing, transformation fruitfulness. It's very important to do so because Jesus will reject those who bring Him no fruit when He comes to judge us on that last day. You want to bring something, you know, to use a human example. I want to bring something to the party. There's going to be, there's going to be a great day. There's going to be a great rejoicing. There's going to be a great feast, a great banquet, right? I want to bring something. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think of someone inviting you to somewhere. What's the first question you ask when someone says, well, y'all come over for supper. And we'll, can I bring something? Can I bring some dessert or some drinks or whatever, right? The Lord's inviting us to this great feast and He's telling us, hey, you need to bring something. You need to bring something. 
So bearing fruitfulness, that's, that's also a second very important goal as a Christian. Lots of things we do as Christians, but the transformation from the old to the new, bearing fruitfulness, and then the third thing, of course, faithfulness, faithfulness. Matthew 24, 13, what does Jesus say? Uh, but the one who endureth to the end, he will be saved. Well, it says, wait a minute, some say, wait a minute, in Mark 16 it says, those who believe and are baptized, they'll be saved, correct, yes. And then that believing and bapti that baptized believer needs to continue believing until the end. Jesus adds that idea. Let's face it, the ultimate goal is not to be destroyed, but to make it into heaven. You know, while playing goalie, I did let in some goals, obviously, every game, sometimes a shutout, but most of the time somebody scored against me. And I couldn't always control the play, but if I would have been hit in the forehead with a stone hard puck at 80 miles an hour, I could have really been injured or killed. As a matter of fact, one of the last games that I played, I remember a guy coming in for a breakaway and he shot and he hit me in the face with the puck and then to add insult to injury, he tripped and then hit me in the face with his stick. And I decided, you know what, maybe I'll take a baseball or something. No, I just <laughs> Maybe ping pong, you know what I'm saying? That way there's less chance of injury. My point I'm making with that silly story is that those other things were important, but if I got hit and injured, man, I wouldn't even be able to play. So nothing else counts in Christianity if you don't make it to heaven. So when Christians are making decisions about friends or work or marriage partners, the most important question to ask should be, how will this affect my number one goal of going to heaven? If it, whatever it is, creates an obstacle or slows you down or poses any threat to this goal, don't do it. It's a great filtering mechanism to ask that question. How will this affect my going to heaven? Will it in, will it any way create an obstacle? Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 36, or 26 rather. So nothing or no one should get in your way of going to heaven. Brothers and sisters, we need to be ruthless when it comes to that. Ruthless. No one is going to take away or jeopardize my going to heaven. Jesus said something like that, right? You've got to hate you know, brothers and sisters, parents. You know. If you love them more than me, he was kind of saying, or I'm kind of saying what he said. Don't let anything get in your way of following me. Everything we do here, worship, Bible class, midweek services, ministry areas, even individual discipline when it's needed, all of these things are done to help each member stay focused on their most important goal, and that is going to heaven. So it's never too late, of course, to reevaluate and reestablish our goals because it's easy to become confused and discouraged, to drift away because of busy schedules or problems or too many amusements or even offenses caused by our own brethren. A lot of times people stop coming to church because some other brother or sister said something or did something that hurt their feelings. And so what they do is they just, they just back away. Now thankfully in this town, uh, in, in Oklahoma City area, we've got 70 other churches of Christ. So if you're in conflict, maybe you can go to another church and find a way to serve there. Always better to resolve your own conflict, however. In the small place or, or in places where the church is not very strong, like in Montreal where Lisa and I have worked for many years, if you stop going to one church, you don't have a lot of choice. There may be another one or two that you can go, that you can go to. A lot of times we're the ones that hurt each other to the point where we make a brother stumble or not. Heaven forbid that I'm ever the one or you're ever the one that causes someone else to just stop Stop being faithful. So everything we do here is always geared towards helping each individual member 
from the youngest member to the eldest member, uh, helping them to go to heaven. So it's never too late, I say, to reestablish, reevaluate our goal, never too late. Uh, we're heading into the fall season, school starts again, you know, renewal time. This can also be a good time for renewal and recommitment in our spiritual lives as well. So I encourage you to shake off the dust and wipe the slate clean, reorder your priorities beginning today. And if you're a Christian, remember what your goals are given to you by God. Transformation, so you can become more like Jesus Christ and less like you. For new Christians, this is what you have to begin learning. For older Christians, this is what you have to start showing. See the difference? And fruitfulness, so you might bring a harvest of good works to the Lord. For new Christians, this means finding what your talents are and putting them to use. And for older Christians, this means helping others develop their talents by your example and your team. And then of course, the major goal of faithfulness. So you can reign with Jesus forever in heaven. For the new Christians, this is the number one priority that will now guide your life. And for older Christians, this means that you may retire from your job, but you never retire from being faithful to Jesus Christ, never. If you're a Christian and you haven't been pursuing these goals or you didn't know these were the goals to pursue, I urge you to commit yourself to them today while you still can, because you never know how long you have to reorder your life. And if you're not a Christian, if you're only one, your only one goal is to be saved, and you can do that this evening as well by believing in Jesus as the Son of God and acknowledging that faith to the assembly, repenting of your sins, and of course, being immersed, being baptized in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. So make sure that your goals are set today and come forward if you need help to reorder those goals or to reestablish those goals or even to begin practicing those goals. We have a song of invitation that we've selected and I encourage you to stand and sing those and if anyone is subject to our invitation tonight, please come forward now as we stand and as we sing.